Hello everyone, and welcome to this mini lecture on Introduction to Fiction, Part 4, Setting the Symbols. So this mini lecture is going to focus on the setting, uh, and what are some symbolic or representative imagery that we see come up in setting, and what are some ways we should be thinking about or looking at that. I should say again that this this um, this mini or this collection of uh, introduction to fiction series uh, is largely inspired by Thomas Foster's How to Read Literature Like a Professor, which again I can't advertise or encourage people to read enough. All right, so I kind of like to start with this: like, there's no place like home, um, and I have that imagery, of course, of uh, the Wizard of Oz. And really, that idea of you know place as significance. We often talk about living places, uh, or living in places, or living at places. But I think an important piece within fiction that translates into our world is n we inhabit places, but places inhabit us. Our environment in influences us. In fact, this is a major piece within the world of social science is that question of how much, you know, of nature versus nurture. How much is genetic and how much is environment? And I think it's important to recognize that environment we know plays a significant role in our development. And so there are ways in which our environment inhabits us. And so we should be aware in fiction, in really all literature, in really all storytelling of how, f of how the environment impacts the event or the story. So let's take a look. So let's take a look at something like rain. I've mentioned rain before, but let's let's take a look at what purpose does it serve within a story. It can be cleansing, right? Rain cleans away things and you know it cleans surfaces, it drops upon everybody. It can represent fertility. And people don't always understand this connection, but we have to think about, you know, we, we always have that April showers bring May flowers, right? The idea that <coughs> the abundance of water and nourishment that we get from water falling from the sky does encourage fertility. Now, it's fertility of flowers, and as we said before, flowers can often be symbolic of a female sexuality. So there's fertility to be found in rain. But rain can also be <laughs> negative. Rain can be flooding. It can be destructing. It can be destructive. It can represent destruction, right? When it storms down and, and you know, does serious harm, right? A hurricane <laughs> is rain. You know, it's a lot of wind, but it's rain. And that can represent the devastation or some, you know, unnatural or natural force doing harm. Rain can also represent drowning. Um or it can lead to drowning, kind of again with that flooding, with that inundation of, of water into our lives. So why use rain? Or why do authors use rain? It's mood setting, right? We have that classic, and this is kind of where I get the background of the lightning storm from, from it was a dark and stormy night. Right, that's a that's a very classic line of horror fiction, uh, going back to the early eighteen hundreds, and the idea is that rain does set a certain kind of mood. Um, more often than not, it's not a cheery mood. It can help the plot, right? It can serve, you know, can very much serve the plot and help push the plot forward. So it can just be used as a plot device, but it's a useful plot device because it has it creates certain moods. Um, it also presents the opportunity for increased difficulty, right? If if you've got a if the if the character has to perform some kind of feat outside, it gets made that much harder when it's raining, right? And we've all been you know we've all been experienced that we have to walk somewhere or even we have to drive somewhere, and it's downpouring. And what was going to be a simple task has now been increased. Yeah, the difficulty has been increased. But the other reason why they might use rain is is that it's democratic. And all this means is that it rains on everyone. Everybody gets rained on. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are of the upper class or the low class. You may have an umbrella, but you still have to wield that umbrella for protection. Rain is in some ways democratic. It reaches out to everybody. Um, it doesn't just hit some people and not others. We're all impacted by it. Other elemental effects, fog. Fog is always a great literary device. Uh, it can represent confusion. 
right? Literally the inability to see in front of you. Uh, this is used a lot of times to, you know, communicate that, that there is a fog of the character's nature. But it can also be a bridge to another realm. There's lots of stories in which the character enters a fog, enters a unclear place, and ends up somewhere else. Rainbows are also used. Um, they can often represent a higher power. They can often represent magic, right? So they can be this, you know, the, this um, gateway, if you were, right? And we talk about magic, right? The leprechaun at the end of the rainbow with his pot, pot of gold. Uh, it can represent, an, you know, this higher power can be a, a sign. Uh, in mythology, of course, in, in Greek mythology, the rainbow is uh, an act of a god. And so god or goddess, I forget, um, but you do see that in, the, in that idea of a rainbow in a story might be the presence of a god, might be a reference to magic. And of course we have snow, which can represent death and danger. Uh, if you've ever read Jack London stories, when you get to American Literature 2 or you've read them before, the snow can definitely be uh, death or danger. Um, to Build a Fire is a great example where snow represents death. Um, and it can, you know, be a threat um, to the characters. So and it doesn't even, ha you know, it can be in other ways too. Dri if you're a character, if the character is driving on the roads, um, snow is still death and is still potentially death and danger. Again, it can also be cleansing, just like with rain. It can serve that purpose depending on what else is going on in the story. And just like rain, it can also be democratic. All right, so space has meaning, and we want to think about where our characters are, where you know the the, phys the physical layout, the the immediate place, but also the larger place of where they are. So the the room they're in, but also where is the house, and what kind of house is it? And you know, is that located in a town? Is it located in a city? Is it you know a castle in some mythical land? These things tell us more about the the story as a whole. So. You know, when we look at the house, we want to, th you know, we tend to think of if a par if a character's in a house or in their home, there's a sense of family and belonging. There's a sense of safety. There's a sense of nostalgia, right? So we should be aware that these are these are easy go-to places or easy representations of a person's house, right? Their home carries meaning with them. And so we should be aware of that, and should, we should be looking for that whenever a character is at home. Is that you know, is the home representing family? Is it representing safety? Is it representing nostalgia and a longing for the past, right? A longing to return home, even though that home may never be there or may no longer be there. But also, when you see things like tunnels and caves and sewers. You know, you should be aware of characters going into a tunnel or going to a cave or going into something that's lower, you know, going into a valley. These can all indicate something dangerous. They can represent the character being lost or being confused, right? Or not sure of where they are. Or being trapped, right? Being in caves and sewers and tunnels, there's a, there's a sense of confinement. There's a sense of, of being locked away. Um, and so we want to think about, or, or when we see these things in action, right, when a character is talking about looking at or thinking about home, theirs or others, we want to recognize those, you know, family safety and nostalgia may be what is significant, what is the symbol being or, or is being symbolized. Same with tunnels and caves and sewers is, you know, any place like that, you may be, the trigger may be around danger and loss or being trapped. Also be aware of high and low spaces, right? So, you know, if a character's in a high space, there's a good chance of them being, you know, feeling freer than if in a low space, right? If you're on floor number two versus floor 15, unless, of course, <laughs> the character's afraid of heights. And then, you know, then we see irony p come into play. Direction. Know that if a character is specifically heading in a direction, there's often a certain amount of weight associated with it. So if the character is heading east, that often means, at least within the United States, in American culture, heading east means heading to civilization. Because east is where the country was originally founded. Right? Think of the colonies are all, the, the original 13 colonies are all on the east coast. So if you have a character who's in, you know, the Midwest and is going to New York, 
he's heading towards civilization, not away from, um, you know, away from the, the frontier. West typically is dealing with individualism or, or heading out on one's own in American tradition, right? Characters head out west to be their own man, and also they're heading out to a frontier. Uh, they're heading out to encounter, you know, the place where civilization meets, you know, barbaric society. Um, this is not necessarily accurate because we know many Native Americans were civilized in a variety of ways, but that is the trope that, or that was the theme that became a belief whether it's true or not. We also have heading south, and usually when you go south, you're going for adventure. You, you know, we see it today with, uh, particularly with uh, spring break among college students, you go south typically. You go to Florida, you go to uh, Louisiana, you go to Mexico, right? You go south for an adventure. And this has been historically true, is that you go south to the jungles, you go south to lands that are defined by Western culture as exotic, except for the people that live there, they're defined as just culture in, in the world and in normality. But in American literature, in typically Western literature, going south means looking for adventure. But going north means looking for challenge. Right? If you're heading north, you're heading up into the cold, you're heading up into mountains, you're heading up into environments that are going to be physically challenging and potentially hazardous. Going south can be hazardous because of what you encounter, but north also, it, it's often seen, south is more seen as adventure, whereas north is seen as a challenge, as a, as a man against nature kind of um, dynamic. So we also have seasonal conditions, and looking at the ways in which seasons can also represent character attributes. So when we look at spring, we're looking at youth, fertility, and happiness, right? We, we, when stories are invoking spring or themes of spring, these are what you want to look, look for or think about, is that we're either talking about youth, we're talking about fertility, or we're talking about happiness. Um, that these are the things that really represent um, or, or that seem to be at play in spring. We talk about spring as a happy time. It's when, you know, it's when the, the birds and the bees are, are doing their thing. It's when we think about youth and kind of when we look at nature in spring, we see the budding flowers, we see really nature awaking, new things growing, all of that. When we get to summer, we're dealing with adulthood, right? We're dealing with people who are who have gotten past that, that youth and are now trying to make sense of their lives. Um, I think it's interesting that when you look at a story like The Great Gatsby, it does start to, um, it, it does deal with, you know, going into, or it starts in the summer. Uh, it starts with adulthood. Summer is also with, uh, you know, also the time of flourishing. So you've moved from, you know, from just kind of getting out in the world to actually, you know, finding one's own place in, a, in society. And then we get into fall. In fall, we can think of as middle age. Uh, we can think of reaping the rewards and punishments of your flourishing of your past two seasons. Right? We think of fall as the harvest season. And so now you get to harvest your rewards, or you don't get to harvest your rewards, depending on what you've done in, in your previous life. And Again, here with the with these seasons, you want to remember if this is when the story takes place, recognize that these things may be at work. And then when we get to winter, we're dealing with old age, we're dealing with stagnation, and we're dealing with death. Not necessarily fun things, but that's that is kind of how we think of winter. Um, you know that that th the trees, nature is withering away. It's going into hibernation, which you know for nature in some ways is a death. Um, you know, flowers, they die, and then new ones come back next year, or stagnation, right? Uh, you know, the character may have hit a wall and is having trouble getting past it. If we think about win winter, we tend to slow down, we tend to not be as active and out, and of course, it's also a time in which, you know, death is more likely to occur. There's ice on the roads, um, it's colder out, people are not necessarily as prepared to deal with the weather. But of course, irony can flip any of these. Um, anything mentioned herein 
whether it is the seasons, whether it is weather, irony can come in and really flip this on its head. Alright, that's all for now. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.